Good evening and welcome to the Bloggers Magazine on i24 News where we give you a different perspective on social stories and trends from the Middle East. Today we take a look back at some of our best stories and discussions from the past few weeks as we take you behind the scenes of i24 News. We thought it's only fitting to begin here at the entrance to the channel located in the historic Jaffa port. Not far from here is Jaffa's Shuka Pishpeshim, or the flea market, which is where we shot parts of our next story. Let's take a look at our portrait of the Israeli friar and the discussion that followed with our guests, Yehoshua Oz of the No Friar website and journalist Niv Ellis. A friar is someone who thinks something is valuable and then buys it at a very high price. I am a friar. I'm always excited to buy anything I see at the highest price. You can be a friar if you're an idiot. Someone who doesn't haggle like my wife. It's not being a friar, it's being smart. Being a friar is being naive, believing people. The word friar, with Germanic and Yiddish roots, most directly translates to mean sucker. This fear permeates the daily dealings of life in Israel, where people are constantly working lo latzet friar, not to be a sucker. Jaffa's Shuka Pishpashim market is one place you can watch the fight against being a friar play out, like this shopkeeper who sells a sign even though he knows there's a major spelling error. I had 50 signs like this. I've sold 45. Yesterday, a woman told me there was a mistake on the sign. It's supposed to read, we'll save the day, not we'll gave the day. Are you going to call them and tell them? No. If I sold 45 of them, it can't be that bad. They're not friars, they're defects. In the international business world, this character trait can be even more problematic. I came in shock coming to Israel. Like, I would have no clue in how to do business in Israel. And, you know, I, I see folks that have just recently come here. I'm like, good luck. I mean, I, the reason I was able to is because I went to the military, and even then I had difficulty. Alon Ben Shoshan is an Israeli tech entrepreneur who lived in the U.S. until age 15 and has worked both there and in Israel. On the popular crowdsourcing question and answer site Quora, a question was recently posed, why are Israeli people so hard to work with? The question, asked by a high-tech worker in Silicon Valley, garnered over 60 responses, some maintaining and some defending this assumption of Israelis. We're in this ex constant existential crisis, and I think that's also what drives the entrepreneurship in this country. The only way to stay afloat um, in terms of your personal economics is to cut corners here in this country. I'm living in Hanana. I'm not in the middle of Tel Aviv, I'm not in a luxury apartment I'm renting, and um, I'm barely able to finish the month where my expenses are food, uh, you know, childcare a little bit, and um, you know, that's about it. We have one car and we don't really use it that much. I bike to work or I take the bus to work, right? Uh, and because everyone's in that situation, they're always trying to do combinot, right? Alon is not the only native to believe the fear of being a friar stems from Israel's daily struggles. The country is constantly in action, wars and so on. We always feel we are robbed. People are warm-tempered because of all the events. Gaza, the north, Lebanon, Syria. People always feel like they get screwed, so they screw each other. Here, this is also a friar, and this one is not. All right, let's begin with you, uh, Niamh. What do you think is the source of this trait? I think a lot of it is historical. Listen, the Jews have been through a lot, and the kind of people that get here is sort of a self-selecting crowd, people that are tough, people that manage to immigrate to survive a lot of difficult events. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that, you know, that's, uh, that's the kind of trait that you really need in order to survive. Um, that said, it's also part of the Middle Eastern culture. It's in a way showing the way that we've integrated into the culture here. The, the, uh, the market culture going and haggling at the shuk, you know, to make sure you get the best price. Right, right. Because one could claim that actually, instead of this being the, the result of the, you know, the difficult life in Israel, life is difficult in Israel because of this trait. What do you think? Well, that could be true, but I think I would agree a lot with what, what Neve said, that um, First off, I think there's a basic human desire not to be 
treated uh, poorly, to be taken advantage of. Everyone wants to be treated fairly. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps the Jewish people have a, a unique experience with this, coming from different places around the world where we're often mistreated by authority figures, by government, by other cultures and other peoples. Right. Um, and that even extended here to pre-state Israel, and maybe even to some extent today. <laughs>back behind the scenes in the I-24 News makeup room where all of our guests come to powder their nose before our show. Certainly one of our more interesting recent guests was Julian Feather, the co-founder of Tel Aviv's first cooperative bar. Here's a story we ran about the new kibbutz movement in Israel, followed by a discussion with Julian and, and journalist Sharon Utsain. The early Zionist collectivist ideals have indeed fizzled. Capitalism has won over socialism. The new Israelis have said goodbye to the calf, the pigs, and the chicken pens, and hello to hotels, malls, and amusement parks. But the kibbutz movement is not completely over. The latest development is a new city-style version of sharing and caring collectively. A younger generation that wishes to bring back their forefathers' pioneering spirit has created the urban kibbutz. The idea is simple. You don't have to grow cucumbers and live in the hills to share ideas, expenses, and incomes. And so the building engineer can share his salary with a student or a teacher. Another option for communal-like living in Tel Aviv is the recently opened bar and supermarket co-op. The K-Mark bar is owned by its members and employees. All salaries are equal and the tips are shared among everyone, including the busboy. Decisions are made democratically and prices for members are 30% under the average market price. And of course, all the benefits are shared. The idea was to transform the symbol of consumerism, package goods and high prices. An idea born out of the Occupy Wall Street-like demonstrations on Rothschild Boulevard in 2011. So whether you share your salary, join a co-op, or have a drink at your collectively owned bar, there are many new ways to escape the oppressive capitalist system. All right, Julian, I, I want to begin with you because you uh, took part in the Rothschild uh, movement mm -hmm. a couple of years ago and something happened yeah. because of it. Yeah, we de we decided uh, to uh, open, uh, uh, um, uh, as it was said, a collectively owned bar, a cooperatively owned uh, bar, the Bar Kaima in Amshbir uh, Street in Tel Aviv. Yeah. yeah. Um, how, how is that significant to you? How uh, it was significant to me? Okay. See, for, for me personally, personally, I, uh, it was uh, um, it, uh, it it showed me that it is possible to achieve uh, great goals if you work to, uh, work together. Uh, all these cliches uh, uh, do imply if you uh, really have a, a common goal and uh, uh, um, uh, and uh, and want to achieve uh, something that that, that can uh, influence a, a big number of people, large number of people. <laughs> Without a doubt, the most provocative portrait we had these last few weeks was on the extreme vegan activist group 269. Based here in Israel, this international organization has grabbed the world's attention with uh, some controversial protests, public brandings, human blood meals and severed cow heads are included. The item inspired the great vegan debate with our guests Omri Paz, the founder of Vegan Friendly, and journalist Danny Swibel. We warned you before and will warn you again, this next item includes some graphic footage not suitable for a young or squeamish audience. Brandings, decapitated cow heads, the human blood, the International Animal Rights Group's 269 uses extreme methods to get their message across. Watching the chickens wander around his backyard in Tel Aviv, you would not necessarily guess that this is the home of Sasha Bujor, the founder of 269. In his backyard, he's built a small animal shelter for chickens that he has saved. Each day, like uh, 15,000 chicks in Israel uh, go through this process, like they like shred them alive or uh, 
and, and throw them alive in the garbage bin uh, to die slowly from exposure or just uh, pressure and stuff. So she's the lucky one. 269 gained worldwide attention in October 2012 when Sasha and two other vegan activists branded their bodies in Tel Aviv's Rabin Square. The controversial and provocative video went viral and was viewed by hundreds of thousands within weeks. It's not pleasant to get branded with a number from a boiling hot iron, but at the same time, I was pleased that it all went well. It was a relief. We wanted to present the life story of this one calf, number 269, to show his life story, to show everyone that he's a living thing. It's easier for people to identify with one individual rather than with a mass. That's just human nature. 269 is the ultimate anti-institutional organization. It has no CEO, no formal recognition. It is a global activist movement that inspires itself. If someone wants to act, if they feel inspired by our activity, they should simply act on it. They don't need permission from me or from anyone else. We met Sasha just before 269's 5th international event in late March, which took place in the Suzanne de Lal Center in Tel Aviv. Hey, Oli, your victim has arrived. Basically, we're intending to create an art installation that will involve cutting the veins of the participants to create a connection between the blood of the animal they're eating and the blood that runs in the veins of every living being, including ourselves. I see red gloves. Maybe they are butchers. Maybe they sell meat. So I said we should stay here. There's going to be a surprise. I don't see the division between animals and humans. Humans are also kind of animal. Biologically, it's just a fact. From my point of view, when I see what humans are doing, murdering, raping, killing each other, I don't have much love for our species. We're a very destructive species, very violent. Modeling. All right, Amri, let's, let's begin with you. This is obviously kind of an extreme example of, of the activism that, that takes place. Do you know any other extreme examples or maybe also some moderate ones? Yeah, well, first of all, it's important to understand that the reason why they do uh, the extreme uh, exhibitions is uh, for um, people to... All the people in, the, in their daily life are extremely... Um, they they don't realize what's going on in the in the factories mm -hmm. and that's the way of them to kind of you know uh, stir up people and to show what's going on and there isn't anything that's uh, less extreme in what's going on in the factories and what they're showing so that's their way to show exactly what's going on to 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 stop people from their daily life from their jobs from their uh, f uh, um, social life right. and to for them to understand what's going on right the question is is it working and i guess we'll we'll turn to danny for that see this is the question i mean traditional slaughterhouses are obviously a disgusting thing the way chickens are raised the way we get our eggs a lot of these systems are very disgusting and i un understand that people should see certain things but is it changing minds i don't think so because i don't think people get changed by a lot of fear mongering which is kind of what these groups are doing they're scaring us into believing a certain way and nobody wants to be convinced in that kind of manner in my mind well, what do you think? Well, I think uh, two things. First of all, just the fact that we're talking about it, that's also one thing. It raises the, the awareness. But the second thing, uh, it's empiric. You need to ask 100 people that watch this uh, kind of uh, technique and ask them, what do you feel after watching it? If most of them will say, it uh, makes me go further than veganism, then that's, that's the result. <laughs> That was certainly one of our favorite shows. Before we wrap up today's show, we wanted to give you a glimpse at our control room, which is uh, where our crew usually sits during the taping of each episode. We'll end our show with a look at our two favorite bloggers' choice from these last few weeks. Here they are. 
I'd recommend nofriars.com. Everyone of should course. check it out, especially uh, if you live here in Israel. It has a lot of useful information that can help you be a better consumer, a better citizen, let you know your rights, what opportunities are out there, and uh, I encourage you to look at it. The Odyssey Expedition. It's got this British guy who's going all around the world. He wants to go to 193 countries, experience all different things of culture and style and ideas, and he's trying to do it all without traveling on an airplane. I see. And eat meat in uh, each of these countries? I'm sure he's going to try a lot right, of different no, things there no. in his travels. <laughs> That's it for today's edition of Bloggers. I hope you enjoyed watching us. Next week, we'll be back in the studio with a whole new show for you. You can check out our website till then, i24news.tv. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.